How to be a Christian nationalist, lion taming and dragon training. This talk is not a pitch for a yes vote in Scotland's independence referendum, despite me wearing my yes shoes. The referendum which is only just three weeks away from us. Uh, those who watch the video online will have the advantage over us here today of knowing the result of that poll. What I've been asked to share today are some broader reflections which have been shaped by the debates around Scotland's referendum on how Christians should think about nationalism. Working out what we think and feel about nationalism and national identity is, I think, one of the most important issues facing us in the 21st century. 100 years after the outbreak of the First World War, the nation state is still the dominant unit of political organization in the world, and nationalism is still the most common source of legitimacy and motivation for those who want to defend or create a nation state. So my argument today is, I hope, a fairly simple one. It's based on three convictions, that nationalism is not going to disappear anytime soon, that nationalism is not inherently unethical, and that nationalism needs to be discipled. I use the language of discipleship because I'm approaching this as a Christian and as someone who does some of my work in Christian political theology. And discipleship is the word we use in the Christian tradition for learning as we follow Jesus Christ to love what God loves and to let that love shape our living. And one of the great traditional emphases of Reformed theology and one which has been a strong influence on Greenbelt over the decades, has been the belief that every area of our living needs to be discipled, both the personal and the political. A lot turns then, in the first place, on how we define nationalism. And this is something I tackle in more depth in my book, Honey from the Lion, on Christianity and the ethics of nationalism. Because some people define nationalism as loving your own national identity at the expense of others. And if that's the only definition possible, then I would accept that Christians can't be nationalists. But I believe it's possible and it's helpful to embrace a more open definition of nationalism, one in which nationalism is a set of claims to identity and to jurisdiction and to territory. Now, is it dangerous to make such claims? Of course it is, which is why I'm talking about lions and dragons. But if someone asks, should we abandon the making of those claims altogether, then my answer is no. I don't think the world is ready for a utopia where there are no countries or borders. And I think attempts to create such a utopia are likely to do more harm than good. What we need to do is to weigh those claims that people make. So how do we do that? Well, I want to suggest that in a Christian vision of nationalism, we start with a theology of creation in which we recognize that we're one human race, but we are called to be stewards of diversity. And so we confess the way in which human sinfulness distorts diversity into prejudice and division. But we respond to that if we're disciples of Jesus with a penitent and a passionate political discipleship in which we learn to love and steward what is distinctive about our own identities without seeking to diminish or dominate somebody else's identity. The Puritans used to say every place is immediate unto God. And that means that there are no parts of the world which are in principle God forsaken, not even England. Uh, but equally, all of us live east of Eden in the Genesis term. So there are no parts of the world which are in principle closer to God than others, not even Scotland. <laughs> Let me use an illustration from the traditional theology or liturgy for baptism. A Christian nationalism, I want to suggest to you, is one which renounces the world, the flesh, and the devil. Now, what does that mean? By renouncing the world, I mean it renounces imperialism and the desire to dominate or invade other peoples. Instead, it practices recognition and cooperation. By renouncing the flesh, I mean it rejects ethnic prejudice or superiority, and it works with a civic or a multi-ethnic definition of the nation. We like to say proudly that Scotland is a mongrel nation. In Woody Guthrie's words, this land is my land, this land is your land. And by renouncing the devil, I mean that a Christian nationalism recognizes that every other allegiance in our lives is held under the lordship of Jesus Christ. 
In this, it follows the lead of the Barman Declaration, which Karl Barth and others drew up in opposition to Hitler and the Nazis. So no Christian can ever say, my country, right or wrong. Now, the dilemma for us today, and what makes this such a difficult and demanding question, is that nationalism has a very mixed history. So we live in the shadow of fascist and imperialist visions of nationalism, which have been a terrible source of oppression for many people. But we've also seen throughout the 20th century how nationally organized liberation movements were key to the struggle against colonialism across the world. Think, for example, of India claiming its right to, to, to live freely uh, outside of British imperialism. So my argument is that we need to imagine a new kind of nationalism, one in which the savage instincts of lions and dragons, which we have on our flags, those savage instincts are tamed and trained, one in which oppressive and selfish visions of national interest are broken open so that we can get honey from the lion. The vision is of an internationalist nationalism, and the prize is a peaceful and a friendly belonging to the Commonwealth of Nations, one where we claim the vision behind the BBC's motto, nation shall speak peace unto nation. In a world where competing and violent nationalisms are still a huge source of threat and danger, the goal of discipling them, I think, is a more fruitful one than a romantic vision in which we all simply hold hands and sing, imagine there's no countries. Now, the way to this goal is going to be difficult and dangerous, but to see it as a pilgrim way for disciples is to see it in the context of Christian hope and to see it in hope as following in the way of Jesus Christ. It's also, I think, to see it in the light of the great vision of Revelation, where heaven is a place where every language and every people and every nation are united, and they're united under the sovereignty of the lion. But when you look to see the lion in the book of Revelation, what you see instead is the figure of the slain lamb. People are united in their diversity under the peaceful rule of the Lamb. A vision of discipleship uh, which extends not just to our personal lives, but to our political lives as well. How to be a Christian nationalist, taming lions and training dragons. Thank you very much.